thanks so much, Xavier, for the introduction, for the very kind int introduction. And it's a pleasure, it's always a pleasure to be back in, uh, in Brussels and, and at the bank. So, you know, this being a keynote uh, address, I figured rather than presenting a specific paper, I, was, I thought I'd give a bit of a broader uh, overview of, of some of the things that I've been uh, thinking about and uh, working on. So uh, let me just give you a roadmap of where I'm going to try to go over the next 45 uh, to 50 minutes. So first, um, I'm not going to take it as granted that all of you here know exactly what we economists and academic economists mean by global value chains. So I'm going to give you a very brief uh, crash course on, uh, on what are what are global value chains. Then I'm going to overview work. Um, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be fair to the literature. There's some great people that have contributed a lot to that literature. I'm going to give you a bit of, a, a more, of an overview that is more centered on my own recent work on this. In the process, I'll try to outline some avenues for future work, which is a, 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 a polite way of saying I'm going to flesh things that I think are wrong in how we do things and that maybe uh, misleading and, and some of the things we do, so I'm going to try to kind of be upfront about that. And I need to speak about one of the Ds, and I don't know much about decarbonization. Uh, I know less about digitalization, um, so I'll, I'll tackle a bit deglobalization. But I'm going to be very brief here, and hopefully I can leave a bit of time in the Q&A. I have uh, more thoughts on I'll, what I'll put here, but I, uh, I, I, you know, there's also great papers on deglobalization coming up later today, so I, I'm not going to elaborate on that. Okay. Warning, uh, there's no math in anything that I'm going to say, but I will, some of my work uh, has uh, focused on some technical matters, and I want to give you a brief uh, overview of that. No math, but some of the stuff is technical, but there is a reason why I, I want to cover this, because some of the messages that I want to convey, uh, they're actually tied to some of these technical matters. These are things that we need to tackle to kind of get better answers uh, from the frameworks uh, that we use to kind of evaluate uh, policies. So as a matter of very broad background, uh, obviously I'm an international trade economist. Uh, international trade is something that has happened since times Im immemorial. Uh, one of the papers that I edited at the QJE, one of my favorite papers is a paper on uh, trade in ancient Anatolia 4,000 years ago. Okay, so we know we have documents, records, indicating trade flows at a very, very distant past. Why are regions, why are countries trading with each other? I think we have a good understanding of that at least since 1817, uh, David Ricardo's uh, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, Chapter 7, that's basically the foundational document uh, for our field. Um, so we've been thinking about that for a very long time, and we have great workhorse models that sort of guide a lot of uh, qualitative work in the field, a lot of the quantitative work in the field. But I believe that if you compare those models to the modern world economy, there's a bit of a disconnect. And you can say that about any economic model. Obviously, there's always going to be a disconnect between the model and reality. But what I want to flag is that there's some, some of the, that disconnect is something that we can try to bridge. And is a disconnect that might actually matter for the lessons we draw from models. Okay? More narrowly, what I want to emphasize is that uh, if I look at trade flows in the last 40 years or so, they seem to have been shaped quite significantly by a process, what uh, I'm going to call the globalization of production processes, or more, you know, alternatively, one might call it the rise of global value chains. So what are these global value chains and how do we think about them? How do we write down models to think about how global value chains emerge and how they shape uh, international trade flows? So in end, as, you know, anytime that you think about conceptualizing something, putting it in a model, you need to kind of try to boil it down to essentials. So in my own work, I found a uh, taxonomy that was first suggested uh, by uh, Richard Baldwin and, and Tony Venables, quite useful, which is to think about, at the beginning at least, about two types of uh, global value chains, okay, which they called spiders uh, and snakes, okay, with, uh, uh, for a reason, uh, not just because it's catchy and sort of a bit frightening, but also uh, because there's a, there's a good reason to kind of call them that. So let me tell you what a spider global value chain is. And, uh, Best thing to show you is a picture. So this is a, um, a picture of a Dreamliner, one of uh, Boeing's more uh, recent uh, aircrafts. Everybody knows that Boeing is an aircraft that is produced in the US. Our textbooks, undergrad textbooks, often use it as an example of strategic trade policy, how the US is competing with Europe, Airbus, 
and, and sort of uh, thinking about subsidy wars and things like that. So it's very much this idea that this is an American product. But if you actually kind of dig a little bit deep in how uh, uh, Boeings are produced, you quickly see that most of the parts are actually coming from abroad. Okay, 70% of the parts of the Dreamliner uh, are estimated to be produced abroad. Okay, so when uh, the U.S. is exporting aircraft, uh, a non-trivial share of the value of those aircraft is actually originating in other countries. And many of those countries, for those of you that can see the, na uh, the names here, they're actually, uh, they're actually in Europe. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of a spin on your standard strategic trade policy. Another example which I like is in the auto industry. Uh, okay, so I don't, you know, I'm based in the U.S. I don't know if anybody else has been there recently, but if you're watching American football, um, that have commercials, and the typical commercials you have is like these big cars you don't see in Europe, but these pickup trucks, the F-150, and there's a man with a very deep voice talking about how Ford is 100% uh, committed to being 100% assembled in America. So they make it sound like this is a very American good, you should buy it. Um, well, you know, the word assembled here does quite a bit of heavy lifting. Uh, uh, and, the, you know, you should always read the fine print. This is a foreign parts and domestic parts. So it's, in fact, even for this F-150, which is a, I would guess that's a vehicle that is mostly sold in North America, maybe Central America, about 50% of the value is U.S. value added, but 45% of these things is actually not U.S. value added. Now, you know, Ford is not just uh, produces F-150s. They have a bunch of other models. There's a bunch of, uh, you know, I'm from Spain, so there's a well-known plant near Valencia that produces a bunch of uh, Ford cars. Um, it's been estimated that only about 40% of Ford vehicles are actually assembled in the U.S., okay? And of those uh, that are assembled in the U.S., again, much of the value added is foreign, right? So, you know, if the commercial said something like 30% committed to America, I mean, that, that might be a little bit less powerful, but it might be a bit closer uh, to the reality uh, for Ford. So that's, uh, those are two uh, um, spiders. And why do we think about this as being spiders? Is basically, these are production processes where we can easily identify a core part of the production process, in this case would be assembly. And then the idea is that relative to a, an old world where much of the parts and components that would be used by automakers and other companies were sourced locally or produced in the same factory, what beers, where, you know, this sort of uh, uh, legs of the spider have been getting longer and longer and now they're crossing borders. So we, we now have these big spiders with a core assembly plan and then with different legs. And the Ford example is telling you that it's even more complicated because basically a company is a, is, is sort of a web of spiders. Basically there's very, various spiders, different assembly plants, and they're sourcing the parts and components, these legs going to these different cores. So that's one way to think about this, and then you might want to think about models in which firms are sourcing foreign value added uh, to produce their goods for domestic use or to export, or you might want to think about models where firms are not just uh, bringing inputs into their factories, but they're thinking about where to set up those factories. Do, are we only in the US? Do we, have set up, do we set up assembly plants in Spain, uh, in Belgium, and in other countries? Um, somewhat related, but somewhat distinctly, uh, uh, there's a line of work that emphasizes another dimension of global value chains, which is that it, often it's not just about a core production process and then the legs coming in, but many of the processes that are associated with global value chains, they're multi-stage production processes, where you can easily identify not just inputs and assembly, but like six, seven, eight stages of production, and very often the stages of production are actually uh, taking place in various uh, countries that may be very far from each other. So one classical example is semiconductors, which has obviously been on the news a lot recently, where, you know, you can sort of understand how the industry works, starting with uh, silicon, uh, wafer fabrication, assembly, uh, testing, so on and so forth. And this graph is showing you that basically this production process is very much a global one where goods are, you know, these this chips are going back and forth at different levels of completion, okay? And, you know, this particular example uh, um, indicates that one of sort of the, the, the implications of this is production length, so basically it takes quite a, you know, 100 days to produce one of these chips. Another implication that I'll get to at the end is, you know, when you're operating in uh, so many countries, and you know, we live in a geopolitical world that may create uh, some additional problems, okay? But the main thing from a, from a conceptual point of view is the idea that this is a sequential process where there might be various stages that you need to think hard about uh, where to place. 
So that's two examples. I could put many more examples. Uh, but there's a body of work that has shown, I think, that this is not just a collection of three, four examples. The world economy has really transformed so that when thinking about international trade flows, maybe we don't want to think about them the way that David Ricardo was thinking about them about 200 years ago in terms of exchanging final goods that are locally produced. But more and more, when we get access, like uh, you folks here at the bank have been very generous in granting access to data on, on, on customs data and other forms of data, when we look at this data, we need to understand that essentially what we're seeing are slices of these value chains. Okay, we're not seeing exports of cheese versus wine, we do to some extent, but uh, most, the bulk of what we see are basically chunks of these value chains that happen to cross a border, and because they cross a border, they're recorded as an import or an export transaction. So that begs the question of, in my view, which is if what we're observing is just a part of a much broader, bigger global value chain, can we really think about a trade flow as being independently determined from everything else that happens in that chain. When I look at US importing wings from wherever they were, maybe Japan, wherever Boeing is importing wings, can I think about that import of wings as being independent of the imports of engines? Okay? That's a clear example where you cannot, right? Because most planes have a pretty standard ratio of wings to engines, right? So you wouldn't think that uh, you would be, you know, you'd depart much from that ratio. That's a silly example, but the point is that if you just think about one flow independently of what else, uh, 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 anything else that's happening in the chain, that's likely to kind of generate uh, uh, predictions from models that might not be accurate. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, the international trade field has been thinking about trade flows as being independently determined from each other. I mean, obviously, uh, if something defines the field is the notion of general equilibrium, which is very much telling us that whatever happens at some part of the economy is affected by whatever happens in other parts of the economy. The concept of comparative advantage is very much based on that. But the notion of interdependency that I want to emphasize is, is, is a, at a much more micro level. This is not about general equilibrium. This is not about industry equilibrium. It's at the firm level, decisions in some countries, effects, shocks in some countries have effects on trade flows that might be actually very far from where the shock happened because they're all part of the same uh, value chain. Now, uh, for some of you reading here, uh, sitting here, you might say, well, of course we know this, you know, we've been working on this for 20 years. Yes, there's a very active area of research on global value chains. If you're interested in a, in a, in a broad overview, uh, you can check out a recent handbook of mine with Dave and Chor. Um, there's been a lot of work on this. On the empirical front, we started with what I would call macro me measurement, which is moving away from examples of like tearing, tear down reports where you kind of try to figure out where the, this firm suppliers are. We've gone to macro measurement, co a combination of customs data with input output tables that spits out what we call world input output tables. Okay, and there's various of them available, various levels of quality, but they've been used quite productively uh, in empirical work. There's also micro measurement and work here at the bank is a very good example of this where you know, if you combine say customs data with uh, um, um, value added tax data, you can start to get a sense of how, uh, you know, how much when you're kind of exposed to trade, how that affects uh, domestic producers directly, indirectly, through links and so on. So there's been a bunch of nice work at the firm level, um, but with limitations that I'll flag later, uh, which is uh, where I think more work is needed. On the theor theoretical front, there's a similar dichotomy. There's macro modeling. Um, the so-called roundabout models, uh, models that are basically written in a way that nicely map to this macro world input output tables. Uh, this has been enormously influential. To some extent, it captures very much value chains, inter-industry, global linkages. And I think many central banks have adopted these models. Uh, more recently, uh, the work of Baki and Fadi, I think, has been quite influential in sort of trying to understand a bit better how economies uh, cope with shocks. Uh, but this is very much a macro modeling at the country industry level. Uh, there's also uh, work more at the micro level, firm level approach, which is rather than trying to understand productivity at the country industry level and how it's shaped by both domestic value added by also foreign inputs from other industries, thinking about more about firms, how they make these operational decisions of where to operate, where to source their inputs, and then aggregate those models to kind of deliver counterfactual predictions for how policies are going to affect economies. So there's a, a, a different 
uh, line of this research. And then obviously you might say, well, what about policy? There is the beginnings of policy work in this area, and obviously, uh, you know, academics, uh, they, they tend to react to, 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 to the demand for sort of analysis, and we live in a world where trade policy is obviously very much at the forefront. So there's more and more folks trying to kind of uh, think hard about how to, um, how to design policies in a world of global value chains. So that's a very broad level. I, I, in terms of my own work, um, I'm very much on the firm level uh, side of things, so in, in terms of that dichotomy before, Yes, I've used some uh, world input output tables of, in some of my work, and uh, you know I've, I've written around about models, but the work that I want to tell you about, the work that I think is, uh, uh, I'm more passionate about, say, is, is work at the firm level. And again, as I mentioned before, this is part of um, one might say a revolution in the field in the 21st century, whereby we moved away from studies that were trying to figure out which goods or which sectors countries export and you know, really kind of started thinking about firms as being the main shapers of international trade flows. Work of Mallets, uh, seminal work of Mallets, showing how understanding the exports of a country in a given industry as the aggregation, as the sum of the exporting decisions of heterogeneous firms that populate an industry is something that is not only doable, uh, but is also tends to deliver answers that sometimes are different from those that we would have in a model where all firms are, say, homogeneous, or we just think about an industry level analysis. So that's been enormously influential in the last 20 uh, to 25 years. Uh, how I've contributed to this line of work is arguing that, of course, exporting is a very important way in which firms interact with the world economy. But models like the Mallets framework in which the exporting decision is basically using local factors of production to export consumer goods that are consumed by foreign consumers, it's only one part of the global economy. What we see in customs forms, is, as I argued before, is largely the slices of value chains. So firms are not just deciding whether they only sell to their local consumers or whether they try to kind of sell to foreign consumers, but they're also deciding in producing goods for domestic sales or exports, how do we produce these goods? Do we rely on domestic workers, on uh, uh, physical capital, on automation, or do we actually try to kind of get these inputs from a country that might be able to produce it uh, more cheaply? And not just a country, but maybe a special supplier that we identified uh, in a foreign country. Similarly, even when the goal is to make your consumer goods available to foreign consumers, the Ford example that I started with, is showing you that just thinking about exporting is restrictive and that many firms have uh, decided that the best way to make their goods available to foreign consumers is by actually moving production or part of production closer to those foreign, foreign consumers in the form of uh, global uh, assembly strategies. So the point here is that the set of strategies that firms envision is much more complex than in uh, uh, these workhorse models, these mallet style models, um, so that begs the need for further uh, modeling. There's other distinctive features of work on GVCs. It's not just that they think about a broader set of uh, uh, decisions. Um, if you dig in some of this work, my work, but other people's work, uh, yes, they emphasize the importance of input trade, maybe about two thirds of world trade is input trade, but they also often argue uh, that these models need to kind of come to grips with the notion that the markets for these inputs are very often very, very thin okay, because there's a lot of customization. There's some Japanese producer that maybe produces aircraft wings, uh, but maybe when they sell them to Boeing, they're different wings than when they sell them to Airbus and things like that. So very often with electronics, uh, you know, uh, uh, cell phone producers, the parts they need are very much special to their own uh, goods. So there's customization, finding partners is hard, there's surge and matching frictions, cross-border transactions, uh, um, often uh, uh, are not perceived to be con totally contractually secure, especially when you're ordering with like months in advance and you don't know what you're going to be getting. So there's a lot of issues that arise um, when thinking about trade as this sort of global value change that, uh, uh, that you might think that leaving them out of models is, uh, is not something you want to do. What I want to kind of talk about briefly is, uh, you know, sidestepping a little bit this last few points on customization and matching and so on. But even if you just think about uh, more simple models in which essentially you build on standard models of exporting, but you expand them to think about importing, sourcing foreign inputs, and you expand them to think about global assembly strategies, 
you know, how do these models look like and what kind of lessons do you learn from them? And are they different, the lessons you learn from those models, than more basic models that uh, have been used to think about uh, uh, quantitative implications of, of, of certain trade policies? So the papers that I'm laying out here, I'm not going to talk about all of them, obviously, I'm mindful of time, uh, have tried to kind of make progress on some of these things. So uh, starting uh, from my work with Ford and Tentelnut, which is very much a model of spiders, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I've worked a little bit on snakes, uh, but I'm not going to say much about this. This is a joint work with Alonso de Gortari. Then work on what my, one might call snikers, which is one you can put together models with multiple stages, uh, where you think about where to assemble things, but then you think about where to source inputs for various plants. So it's a more recent work with uh, Farif Ford and Tintelnot. I've thought a little bit about trade policy, um, in particular how uh, you might want to design a differential tariffs on inputs versus final goods in a world in which you're trading both. Uh, so that's recent work with Ford Gutierrez and, and Tintelnot. And it, uh, I might say a word about this last paper, which is... Um, might be of some more relevance for, for central bankers, uh, which is thinking about going back to my semiconductors uh, example where a lot of this growth in the fragmentation of production, especially given that shipping takes time, has, has basically lengthened production processes, which might have been okay, feasible, uh, something that firms could bear in a low interest rate environment, uh, but you know, we seem to be out of that environment, we might come back to it but there's certainly much less clear sense that uh, interest rates are gonna be uh, coming down very fast, very quickly, okay? So I've, I've been thinking a little bit about that. Rather than going over these papers in much detail, I wanted to, what I, what I thought I would do is I, I'm gonna give you a, a very high level overview of um, why are these papers published in good journals, I think, which is in part is because they were trying to solve problems that were not trivial example. Okay, that I personally can attest that some of this work that is published in recent years is things that I had thought about when I was younger, before I had kids, I, I was not very patient, so when I faced a, a hard problem, I would run away from it. And now you, have, you get kids, and then you become more patient, um, and then we finally uh, uh, found ways to kind of crack, uh, crack these problems. So what are these theoretical challenges? So here's where I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna get a little bit technical. And for that, I need to tell you at a very high level what this canonical or workhorse models of exporting uh, look like. These are models that are um, m modern trade models which feature scale economies. Scale economies are gonna be an important aspect of those models. The idea that both in producing and in exporting, firms uh, might face some setup overhead costs or fixed costs of exporting. So you, you want to kind of attain a certain volume to make certain transactions viable. That's at the core of uh, trade models since the work of Krugman in, in the 1970s and 1980s. Mallet supplied these ideas uh, in a framework in which you have industries in a given country uh, which are populated by various firms, and the firms are different from each other. Maybe they have better managers than others, or they produce goods that have different appeal to consumers. So some are expected to be larger than others. And as a result, only the larger firms are, uh, are, have the scale, sufficient scale to be able to afford complex exporting strategies where they're gonna be selling to a bunch of markets, okay? Um, so that's uh, the core of the model where firms are deciding where to kind of sell their, uh, their goods, taking into account that some markets are just way too small for it to, to be profitable. A key idea in, in that framework that is often not flagged is that even though there's scale economies, that's average costs are declining in scale, the way that this uh, uh, scale economy is, is introduced is borrowing from Krugman, but it's a very special form, which is marginal costs are constant. That's not the source of scale economies. It's the existence of this either overhead cost, entry cost, fixed cost of exporting. So it's fixed cost and then a constant marginal cost. That's going to deliver a, a declining average cost. So that's, uh, uh, you know, maybe we feel it's a natural assumption because most people make this assumption. Uh, but if I want to, you know, and, and it's certainly very, very helpful in that in these models you can construct multi-country, multi-industry versions of these models where firms, each firm in the model is looking at its marginal costs, uh, projecting their operating profits when they sell in various markets, they're going to activate the markets for which those operating profits are positive. It's pretty easy to figure out how much these firms are going to sell because 
they have some market power, but they price a, a constant markup over their marginal cost. You can predict sales revenue. It's all fa fairly easy so that you solve this firm level problem and then you aggregate it across firms, across sectors, and then you get aggregate trade flows that we, you can map to your macro data, okay? And the reason this is very easy because firms are solving this problem market by market. If I'm in uh, Bel Belgium, do I want to sell to France, yes or no? Okay, yes, do it. Now Germany, now Spain, and market by market I make that decision because there's no interconnection between those decisions. When I think about spiders, that is, firms that are selling maybe to various markets, but they're also trying to figure out where they should be buying the inputs they need for production, okay? And I think about a framework with scale economies in which maybe this importing decision also entails some fixed costs. I cannot just, uh, from one day to another, start using a component that was produced locally and now it's produced in Romania. I mean, I will have to have created that link go out there, visit, there's a bunch of upfront things you need to do before you're able to re, you know, use that foreign value added. Uh, and you might still wanna do it, why? Because wages in Romania are much lower than wages in Belgium, so after you factored in all this upfront cost, you realize that you're still able to operate more efficiently if you source from Romania than from Belgium. But the point is that the reason you're going to Romania is precise, precisely to affect your marginal cost of production. You realize that if you go there and you start using that component rather than the locally sourced one, that's giving you a lower marginal cost. But if it gives you a lower marginal cost, that's gonna be affecting your scale of operation. If that affects your scale of operation, when you're thinking about how to uh, procure a different input, and you're looking at the upfront cost of sourcing that other input, say from Slovakia or locally sourced, that decision is now affected by this decision in Romania. So the firm cannot be thinking about input by input and making input by input independent decisions. So the problems that firms face are, are much more complex. And it has to do with this interdependency that I was telling you about, which is every, you know, the wings are not independent of the engine, okay? You need to think about the global problem. From a mathematical point of view, this turns what in the Mallets framework is J, if J is the number of countries, J01 decisions, do I want to sell there or not? It turns that into a problem, which is a combinatorial optimization problem with the dimensionality two to the power J. Okay, so if you Google this, you, or, or I mean, you could do that in your head maybe, you know, it doesn't take a very high J to make this completely infeasible. Okay, it's a very complicated problem. Um, it, you know, in models of uh, spiders of, of global sourcing, um, there's further sp uh, sources of interdependency uh, in the sense of um, it's not just whether, you know, I want to go to uh, Slovakia if I'm sourcing else, uh, elsewhere from, uh, 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 say, from Romania. It's also, as I was saying, the scale of production is shaped by the marginal cost, and the marginal cost is shaped by all these decisions. So exactly what is the cost reduction that I achieve is gonna affect how much I wanna produce, which is gonna affect my demand for inputs in all these places that I'm sourcing inputs from. So it's, it's quite a complicated uh, problem. The second challenge uh, is um, uh, to this line of models is even leaving aside the sourcing decision, let's go back to Ford. Ford was producing cars in the US. It, was, it started with a, a, a Model T and so on selling locally, obviously at some point there was foreign demand, they started selling, exporting cars from the US to other countries. At some point they realized some of their models, well, for whatever reason, Europeans really like these cars. Why are we shipping these models from the US to, um, to Europe? These are small cars, Americans don't like these cars, the Europeans do, we might as well just move the pr car production to Europe. So firms face also this global assembly strategy which is in making their goods available to foreign consumers, they decide where to locate that production. That's not just moving the input production to other countries, but actually moving big chunks of production assembly to other countries. That's also a complex problem because when Ford is thinking about, do I wanna produce in Europe? Um, they're gonna have to think about, okay, there's some models that are bought, bought both in the US and in Europe, if we move production to Europe, that European plant is gonna eat market share from our US producers. It's even more complex because Ford, I don't know this for a fact, but I, 
I'm pretty sure Ford has plants in more than one country in Europe. There's one in Valencia, but there might be uh, plants elsewhere in Europe. So they realize that if they start populating all these countries with plants, they're going to start competing with each other. So there's this interdependencies that have to do with what we call cannibalization effects. So whether I want to set up a plant in a country is obviously not independent of whether I want to I have plants in other countries. Okay, that uh, is a force that in models of exporting is not there. In, in my example before, when I sold to France. That had no bearing on whether I want to sell to Germany or not. There's no cannibalization there. But with global assembly, there is cannibalization. But there's also sources, also all, all, other sources of interdependencies. In some of my work, I've argued that uh, if you think about export strategies, this overhead cost of exporting or the overhead cost of importing, if you think about them as firm level decisions, forward level decisions rather than plan level decisions, that's going to generate complementarities by which if I set up certain plants in some countries, it might actually increase the benefit of having further plants. So interdependencies, the sign of this interdependencies uh, is not entirely clear. Regardless of this, in these models, when you write them down, again, the dimensionality of the problem quickly explodes because firm level decisions uh, in a multi-country world are gonna be a function of what else the company is doing in other places. So that requires tools to kind of tackle those problems. Very briefly, in sequential GVC models, the snakes, there's another layer of problems that arises, and that has to do with a, a different sort of interdependency uh, uh, which comes in in the presence of trade costs. And it's really kind of independent of scale economies. Even in a world of constant marginal costs, you would have this, which is in sequential processes where some things have to happen before other things. You need to have purified silicon before you start wafer fabrication, and you cannot assembly chips that have not gone through wafer fabrication. The presence of trade costs generates, uh, um, turns a problem of like picking the location of each stage independently into a path problem, where where you locate a stage is not just a function of how efficiently that stage can be produced in that country, but you're going to think about where is this thing coming from, okay? Uh, maybe there's a country that is very efficient at tire production in the auto industry, but if you need to bring in rubber from very, very far, and if the tires are used by an assembly plant that is very, very far from the tire producer, maybe you're actually going to end up choosing a tire producer that's not quite as efficient, but that is closer to where the rest of the chain is. So that basically, in terms of mathematics, it turns a, a, a simple problem of locating stages to countries into a J to the power N combinatorial problem where N is the number of stages. And if the number of stages is large and J is large, that is again a complex problem. So now maybe you start understanding why you need to have kids to kind of uh, uh, have the patience to kind of think about these things. And I, you know, in some of my early work, I certainly ran away from this. Um, but it turns out that one can make progress. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have the time, obviously, to kind of say much about this, but if you're curious, uh, uh, you can dig into the papers. But it turns out that when you write down these models um, and you write them with the standard assumptions, um, how you model preferences, how you model technology, uh, you, you realize that in many of these problems, even though there are interdependencies and that you end up with combinatorial problems, they're combinatorial problems that where the interdependencies, they tend to go in the same direction. You're often in situations where these decisions are either complements or substitutes. So borrowing tools from micro theory and from uh, structural industrial organization, people have developed tools that use monotone comparative static techniques to characterize the solution of these problems. Maybe we cannot exactly, uh, uh, you know, you might say you cannot exactly know what this firm is going to do, but maybe you can say that on average they're going to do certain things, or you can even go deeper and develop algorithms that can efficiently solve this uh, seemingly uh, intractable problems. So that's something that we uh, showed, for instance, in our 2017 paper for the case of spiders. And for Snikers, this global assembly, the Ford uh, problem, uh, again, we showed that in some cases, these same techniques uh, had some uh, power, and there's obviously many other folks that are contributing to this literature. For the path problem, um, uh, we, you know, I have work showing that if you kind of leave out scale economies, which I think is a, is a, bit, is a bit of a letdown, but if you leave out scale economies, you look at constant returns to scale models, it turns out that uh, 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 
these path problems, you can solve them with dynamic programming, which is another mathematical technique that tends to be uh, useful for this type of problems. And I've uh, students working on this. If you add scale economies, it turns out that dynamic programming uh, appears to be also a, a, a tractable uh, way to kind of uh, uh, solve these models. And then there's other aspects of these models that, um, that uh, still when you've solved this, uh, choices of which countries to operate in, you need to figure out how big you're going to want to be, how much input you're going to demand. For that, we have other tools in the field, uh, mostly coming from, you know, coming, going back to McFadden in the 70s, but like uh, brought into the field by Ethan and Cordham in, in the early 2000s that allow us to figure out exactly, given these other decisions, how large is the firm expected to be and how much inputs is it going to source, how much goods is it going to uh, produce in various countries. So the point here is I started with telling you firms make operational decisions that are way more complex than standard models. When you look at these things, it looks like this is a beast that there's no way firms can solve, can possibly solve, and as an academics, we have no way to kind of solve this. We've made progress in sort of showing ways to solve this problem in certain scenarios, and that's important. Why is that important? Because then we can write down models where we follow this methods approach of think about firms, managers, what are they optimizing, what are they trying to do, try to have models that replicate this, and then aggregate those firm level decisions and work with the aggregate implications of those models to both interpret the data and maybe perform counterfactual exercises where if we have a model that fits what they do, we can shock the model, we can put a tariff here, a tariff there, and see what the model tells us the response is gonna be. What do we get out of these models? On the theoretical front, um, what we know is that uh, if you're looking for models uh, that might explain the rise of superstar firms, why do we see an increasing uh, uh, variance in the distribution of firm sales, these are models that are gonna give you that. These are models where firms that to begin with have better uh, managers or more appealing products, through their sourcing strategies, through their assembly strategies, they're gonna magnify their size difference quite naturally. And in models with uh, variable markups, um, that might also explain why markups have been on the rise uh, uh, in, in recent years. Um, I think these models have led to a fruitful reinterpretation of some uh, uh, salient shocks in the world economy in recent 20 years. In the, uh, so in the US, there's a lot of talk about the China shock, how China's entry into the WTO was a big, big shock to US manufacturing. The standard way this is thought about is as an import competition shock. China started consume, producing a bunch of consumer goods and they flooded the US market and that drove a lot of firms in the US out of the market. Part of the story, for sure, but again, 70% uh, of world trade is inputs and lots of what comes into the US from China are not just consumer goods and Amazon and so on, they're actually inputs. So there's firms in the US that benefited from this China shock because the China shock allowed them to reduce their marginal costs. So uh, uh, in our 2007 paper, we showed that when you look at the effect of a China shock in terms of aggregate manufacturing employment, the effects are much more heterogeneous, okay? Maybe on net, our model indeed uh, tells you that uh, manufacturing jobs uh, uh, declined with the China shock, but the reason for that is much more complex than in the standard interpretation of the reduced uh, form results. In these models, it's also true with roundabout models, when you think about the aggregate gains, aggregate gains from trade or uh, what we are now talking about, which is the uh, welfare costs of disintegration, the welfare costs of the U.S.-China trade war, of, uh, of uh, deglobalization, these models, they tend to give much bigger numbers. That is, uh, if you work with models without this global input-output links, um, the sort of numbers that come out of those uh, uh, counterfactual exercises often are sort of uh, surprisingly low. Like in Ethan and Cordham's famous paper, if the US goes to autarky, it loses about 1.8% of their GDP, which seems like a impossibly low number. So in models with uh, global value chains, when you go to autarky, you're not just giving up on the ability to buy foreign consumer goods. In multi-stage models, multi-industry models, you're giving up the ability to buy those inputs from any country out there. So you're losing the consumer gains from trade, you're increasing marginal costs, so that compounds to generate much bigger costs of uh, tariffs. And there's some implications of that for tariffs and tariff escalation, uh, but I'm a little bit of short of time, so I'm gonna skip that. There's empirical challenges that I wanted to quickly flag. Um, 
they have to do with uh, um, uh, how do we actually measure this, okay? Um, so in the macro side, uh, uh, you know, we know that we want to understand exactly, move away from uh, just the examples with teardown reports where for this company I know where they're buying inputs and have a bigger sense of when Belgium produces in a given industry, uh, what are the sources of that value added? Where are they using value added from? Okay, and that's a challenge because international trade flows, customs forms, they don't have data on that. Do you just know the gross value of a transaction? What people have done is sort of build this world input output tables which combine customs data with input output tables. Um, and a third element, of, and this is the assumptions that are built into it. Um, the way that I define this to my students at Harvard is I, I, I define this global input output tables as uh, sausages. Why? Uh, because uh, they look tasty, they taste really good, but you don't want to know how they made them, okay? <laughs> so that, that's a bit uh, the problem here, that there's a lot of assumptions. Alternative would be to kind of work with firm level approaches and here at the bank they've been really pushing for this. Um, and you know, you can do a lot of things. Uh, you can map customs to census data, to VAT taxes, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's exciting and, and it's fruitful because even though you might only have data for one country like I have had for the US in my own work, you can still discipline models that can speak to the global economy as long as you're willing to assume that uh, the fit that you get from the model you have the data is representative of what you might get in other countries. So you can make progress with just segments of GVCs, but obviously this has to be structural work. You're gonna have to rely a lot on the model because there's a lot of missing data. Another solution is to merge data sets, both at the country level, but ideally across countries. So Andreas has done some, is doing some great work uh, on this, but it's obviously challenging. Some of you might have challenged to kind of convince local authorities to share data with you. When you start combining data from various countries, that becomes uh, obviously uh, much harder. But I think that's, the, uh, that's really the frontier. I'm, I'm running out of time, I'm, I realize that, so, uh, and I can make the slides available. I have slides sort of digging a little bit deeper in my work, uh, empirical work on, with US data, where we've sort of relied on census data, matched them to customs forms, and sort of shed light on the sourcing strategies of firms. We have more recently merged this data with data on the outward uh, FDI of this company. So I told you Ford is a US-based company but has operations in Spain and in a bunch of countries. The US collects data on the foreign operations of their head, firms that are headquartered in their country. So we have data sets that map to this sort of global uh, value chain activity where at least from the point of view of firms that are originating in the US, we can see their export decisions, their sourcing decisions. When they're moving production to for closer to their foreign consumers, we have that operational data so we can map them to the models that I was uh, describing uh, before. And these slides are basically giving you a sense of that. So one thing that I can quickly flag, for instance, that uh, I'll come back to in the very last slide I'll show, um, which is uh, we knew that already from 2007 data that uh, US firms were not diversified. So when we looked at the data back then and looked at um, inputs, input, uh, imports of inputs of uh, US manufacturing firms in a given industry category, like highly detailed uh, disaggregated data, we, we just didn't see any mu much multi-sourcing. Firms were really relying on a single supplier uh, for uh, uh, at least supplying country for input. So they were highly exposed to, uh, to, to country level shocks. That's, we didn't make much of that back then, but obviously uh, that I think helps us explain uh, many things, okay? And then in more recent work, we've been sort of uh, mapping this to multinational firm level data. And one thing that I'd flag is just that, uh, that sort of convinced me to, in my ongoing work to move away from models with uh, monopolistic competition is the, is the incredible granularity in the data. The US uh, has thousands and thousands of firms doing manufacturing but if you look at 1,500 of those companies um, that happen to be multinationals, you have like 80, 90% of everything, okay, of trade, imports, exports. So, and that's across sectors. If you look within sectors, there's often gonna be one, two, three companies that explain everything. So you really, um, you know, I think that sort of reinforces this idea of understand why these firms are doing what they're doing. And if you get the big guys, you're done but this idea that their decisions treat market outcomes as given, that this idea of monopolistic competition, 
to me that lo that looks like the like that that's a, a non-trivial departure from reality that I think our models need to uh, tackle. Okay, um, I'm out of, almost out of time. Let me just say a word about um, um, deglobalization. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave with that, and then maybe we're going to have a Q and A. I think we still have 12 minutes, right? So. Um, anyway, the, in terms of what I've been saying is just sort of flagging this idea of we well, need to think about value chains, we need to think about multinational companies, they shape the world economy, and we need models that I think are good at uh, understanding what firms, not industries, but firms do. Okay, and that's sort of the, there's a potential for counterfactuals that are more reliable. Um, if I look at the US-China trade war, I'll come back to this in, in, in the last couple of minutes, uh, and thinking about deglobalization, when I've written about this for the ECB a few years ago, I found myself uh, making conceptual points that, that, that I couldn't make with the models that I had been working with. And, and in large part, I think that the existence of sunk costs, the idea that this overhead cost of exporting, that the overhead cost of importing, the, uh, the overhead cost of setting up value chains that are often sunk in nature, it's absolutely key for understanding the last four or five years in the global economy. And I haven't seen much work actually putting those things in those models. So I think we need uh, better models. Otherwise, uh, the um, counterfactuals we get from our models are not just wrong, but they're likely to be misleading, which is, which is a problem, okay? So some thoughts on policy and deglobalization. Lots of talk of deglobalization. So I always, the first thing I always wanna say in these discussions is maybe it will happen, but it's not clear it has happened or it's happening very fast. Okay, so if I you know, look at world trade over world GDP that's not down in the last, uh, you know, it, it sort of peaked uh, around the great uh, financial crisis, it's, it went down a little bit, but we understand why it happened and it, it, it is not really driven by the US-China trade war or anything like that. COVID, you know, if, if there was a fragility of the world economy, you would have thought COVID would be a shock that would really shake things up, and it did, but we went back to normal pretty quickly, actually. So even a, a, an immense shock like COVID did not uh, 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 dismantle these global value chains. And I think the sum cost is very important. The idea that uh, maybe we rethink things, but you know, it's a temporary shock, so let's just wait it out and, and we'll see. Same with the US-China trade war. Uh, there's a US-China trade war, geopolitical tensions. Um, you know, if you anticipate that tariffs that you're operating in China, you're bringing inputs into the US, you're gonna face a 20% tariff over the next 10 years, maybe you're gonna pull out. But very early on, this, is, this was Trump, right? I mean, you don't know exactly how long this is gonna be. Now Biden sort of uh, went through and sort of didn't dismantle those tariffs. It's not surprising that we are now seeing a little bit of an impact on trade. But this is not about stuff moving back to the US, it's sort of a reorganization of these value chains. They're still very much global, but we've seen China move a lot of activity to Southeast Asia or to Mexico. The stuff is making its way to the US, it's just not making its way directly. So we have seen a reorganization of trade flows in gross terms, but in terms of value added, there's still a lot of Chinese value added that is coming into the US. It's just coming uh, a different way. I believe uh, this is more you know, centered in the US, so I apologize for this. There's a lot of talk about French shoring. We need to be uh, trading more with our allies, okay? We need to kind of uh, decouple from non-geopolitically aligned countries. I'm really worried about this. I'm really worried about this from the point of view of the US um, for many reasons, but the main one is um, I'm not sure which, down, you know, if, if you make countries choose, um, I don't know who's gonna be an ally and who's not. Uh, Maybe Europe will be an ally, but obviously Europe uh, is not very happy with IRA and lots of things that are coming in the U.S. that's alienated Europe. But if you go to other, if you go to Chile, I was in Chile recently. Chile seems like a great ally of the U.S. But if you talk to policymakers there and then you tell them, would you could you live without selling copper to China? They'd say, no way. There's no way we can. You know, China is by now is the largest trading partner for the vast majority of countries in, in the world, and the U.S. is not. So I think U.S. French shoring policies have, have the potential to dramatically backfire. And there's lots of push for diversification, increased resilience, uh, but I think that's something that needs to be thought really hard. Uh, and folks are. I mean, there's a lot of work thinking about what are the externalities, the market failures that might lead policymakers to tell companies um, you, sh you guys should have been operating differently. I'm a little skeptical about this, and part is because looking at the data, I understand that a big chunk of world trade is 
shaped by super sophisticated companies that spend millions and millions of dollars uh, thinking hard about their uh, global procurement strategies. So I'm not sure policymakers can come in and tell them you guys are making mistakes. When it comes to national security, obviously we need regulations, I'm pro that. Um, but I don't think that firms in the US were not diversified because they were not profit maximizers or because they were not internalizing some externalities. I think to a large extent they were doing so because of scale economies. The only way to make this work is to have a supplier in a low wage country. And if I had to replicate this at home, that's gonna have to come back to increase marginal costs. So we might wanna choose to do that, but that's not gonna come for free. That's gonna jack up costs, it's gonna jack up prices, and we're gonna be losing some of the gains from trade. We might wanna choose to do that for national security reasons, but let's be upfront that this is not gonna come for free. And then I didn't have time to talk about that, but I'm also worried about interest rates. I think the low cost of capital was an important fuel of the growth of global value chains. Um, and if we push companies to reorganize their global value chains, which entails setting up plants in places they didn't have them, which requires large investments, if we kind of force them to do that in, high, in a high interest rate environment, again, that's gonna, we're gonna have to pay the price uh, some way or another. I'll stop here and happy to take questions. Thank you. Well.